Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix online meeting 225, halfway through December. Tomorrow's my little one's birthday, so that's exciting. That's what we're doing today. We're going to do the usual. Uh, what are we? What does that mean? Uh, we have triage. Don't let that surprise you that the agenda is short because we'll talk about moving to YouTube. And that'll be a short part of it, but I think triage is going to take most of the time. And Sean has mentioned, hey, we should review this pull request that he's been hanging out, out there. So we'll look at doing that. And then we'll always take questions and comments at the end. So let's see how long triage takes us because we've had quite a few things pop up. And I think we opened a number of them, which I don't know if that means they're going to take longer or not as long. But yeah, you can never tell. Let's go do that. And then I think Ron's going to go fill up the chat with a whole bunch of problems he's had trying to get C++ stuff working. And we'll probably go hit that in questions or comments. So as always, these meetings are recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now. You're watching on YouTube. Let us move on to triage. Bob, you ready? I am. All righty. Here we go. This says 15 open. That sounds like quite a few. Um, so let's go do that. So um, this is going to come up a couple times, but I've been streaming every Wednesday so far, and you're welcome to come hang out while I write some code inside the Wix tool set. And this came when I was trying, well, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to go add this feature to the Wix tool set. Let's go ahead and do that. And then, I don't know, about five, seven minutes into it, I slowly came to the realization that maybe we shouldn't do this the way that I thought we should. And I stared at it for a while, stared at it for a while, and Sean, who was on the stream, then made a similar comment. Um, yeah, maybe we shouldn't do it the way that we were thinking about doing that. And I was like, well, then I'm not going to make that decision live broadcasting where I have only so much of my brain power to think about new problems and I have to think about all the other things that are going on live. Not quite comfortable there. <sighs> so, root issue. We're back to the .NET framework signing signature thing. I don't want to really talk about it again here. You can go back and find the conversations about it, and it's in this triage too. Essentially, we need to bring back a feature from V3, which allows us to validate payloads inside a bundle via their authentic code signature, the thumbnail of the authentic code signatures certificate. All right, that's fine. We can do that and go bring the V3 code. The original thinking was that we would bring it back as it was, which was to put it in the compiler and you would just say, enable signature validation and the Wix tool set would switch from doing payload hashing to payload signature check. And the payload hashing is way better um, for a lot of different reasons, much simpler, especially to not fail and things like that. But the authentic code signature is needed for things like uh, the .NET framework, which is a slightly important redist at this point. So as I was staring at it, it, I kept going, we don't really want people to use this often, generally. It's, it's not the most common case that you should do. It's generally not a attribute that you should turn on. And that's when I kind of went, well, the only case that we really have for using this is for external payloads that are not under your control, that you're not building, including in your bundle. And that means it only really needs to be on remote payload. Um, and so I was, that made me wonder, well, maybe we should only do this in remote payloads. Thus, it would only really make sense to be used by heat. And that's where I stopped. Um, oh, and then Sean kind of chimed in on chat at that point. It was like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. And if Sean agrees, then I'm kind of inclined to think that that's probably the way we should go. So that's a roundabout way of saying, I think we should push this to only heat and not put it in the compiler. But I wanted to talk about it here with you guys before I shift it to that direction. And then my next comment was that the problem is that some things don't support remote payload today. So then there are some things that you can't use signature verification for. Uh, OK. So is that a feature that or a problem? Bug? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, so I'm, I'm a little confused because today, Thumbprint is only supported on remote payloads. Sorry, in Wix v3, you can only specify a certificate thumbprint on a remote payload already. 
uh, Wix will harvest it yeah, if you and, and allow signature verification. Yeah. So uh, it's explicitly on remote payload because, well, you have to put all the information on remote payload. That's why it shows up there. If you use it inside the compiler to turn it on, then during the bind process, it will automatically pull the thumbprint out of the, the signed binary. Oh, it, okay, okay. So in that case, it will show up. It's supported on every payload in burn. The compiler only explicitly supports it in remote payload. You only visibly see it in remote payloads. Otherwise, it would have gone straight into the map. Yeah, the compiler supports it on remote payload, but the binder supports it everywhere. So what can't be remote payloaded today? MSI package. Everything MSI. except the exe exactly. package payload. All right, so it's easier to say that only exe packages support this. And maybe MSU. But like if you have a payload for the exe package, that doesn't support it today. Payload for the exe package. Yeah, I don't, did we handle that before? We didn't, but. I did, yeah, I, I didn't think V3 cared about that anyway. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by cared about. I mean, people have asked for the ability to have remote payload for all the payloads. No, no, sorry. That, that I, I meant the, could we have the thumbnail, the, th the, the thumbprint Thumb. from files other than the main file? Did the binder I've, do that? Gosh, I guess we'd do it for every payload in, that was marked as disenable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This burn has to verify every single payload. And so far, the biggest one we use it on is the single .NET Framework XE package. But if you set this, it would need that for all like if you had an MSI with external cabs then and the cabs are all signed then you want that mm -hmm. and we don't do remote payloads on MSIs because of all the extra information you have to have Wow, what remote payload for MSI? Oh no, this would be yeah. What is this? This is so you there want is a feature request for that. Someone has asked for it. To be able to not have to provide the MSI file at build time. Yeah, it's essentially let me calculate this once because it doesn't change and hold on to it. I, I can I can get that kind of you can kind of get that with Wix flip. But now you'd have to have the MSIs at one time. Yeah. The problem is that MSIs are much more sensitive to changes, right? Like Well, we'd have to harvest a lot of a lot more data than we do already in heat for remote payload. No, I, I yeah, true. I'm thinking more I mean, the authentic code thing exists so that you can change the payload on the remote location without updating the bundle. What sort of changes can you make what, to an MSI? Was that, was that really the, was, was, I mean, was that the purpose? Well, so I mean, we, because we, the sorry. with the hashing, it never worked. We, it did. No, so we started thinking um, verifying files by signatures was a great idea. And we quickly learned in the real world that it isn't right. <laughs> because of all the um, network communication that can get involved in that which then of course could fail and you, know, you won't have up-to-date certificates. I mean, it has all these problems with it. So that's when we said, all right, let's stop authentic code checks by default, or let's just stop doing authentic code checks and switch instead of just hashing the files. So we did that, um, which means the only real case is if you want to use authentic code, the only reason to take that risk, that ch the thing that could fail, to, is if you want the ability to change the file remotely and not update the bundle. That's the case. Sorry, I, I'm just, I'm trying to understand. Except for today with remote payloads, that wasn't, 
let me ask it a different way. Could you use the existing support in, say, an MSI package? Ignoring ignoring the download aspect, could you use you know suppressed signature verification equals no to omit hash checking from an MSI package, for example? Uh, it would it would no longer check the hash, it would, but it would verify the signature of the file. So you, it would okay. So in that scenario, you could swap out. Yes, the MSI. Correct. Unsuccessfully in most cases, but right. it would Burn verify. Burn would, Burn would verify. Right. By the signature. Yep. Yeah. So a swapped out MSI with the same signature would would be acquired successfully. Correct. Okay. But all the detection and all that other kind of stuff, the metadata. That yeah, the yeah, it was broken. Been, it's, yeah. I mean, it's almost almost certainly broken. Right. Uh, just yeah, even you know uh, minor change in the product version could break it. So so that being the case, I see no reason to pull that forward. Right. MSUs so, are generally MSUs fire. are really hard. They're yeah. they're fire and forget for the most part. So they're yeah. a lot like XE packages. Yeah. And we don't do much in the way of detection. So it it could work the same way. We don't have a lot of knowledge about MSU or a lot of data about MSUs because they're kind of more rare. Huh, okay. I mean, we force the user to tell us how to detect an MSU. Yeah, e exactly. So it should be safe to allow signature verification. Correct. But does remote payload support it today? Or well, how hard would payload it be to enable? doesn't exist today. <laughs> What's that? Remote payload doesn't exist in V4. It's named something different. Right. The the, the remote. So remote. we created a separate element for each package type. So yep. like the exe package payload, I think, is what it is. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember whether I created an MSU package payload or not. Mm. Okay, so a, a separate question, um, just coming down to it, there's, this, this issue is about, is about, you know, Prefer, not preferring, ignoring hash verification if you want to use authentic code. Um, the only reason we have remote payload today is to avoid the need to have the file on disk at build time. Correct. But you can obviously still create a bundle that does not contain attach or layout the file, you can just always rely on a download URL. So in that case, we would force you to use remote payload in order to skip hash verification. Yeah, and I don't, it's, yeah, it's not skipping hash verification, it's using authentic code signatures instead. So, sorry, I, I, I started by thinking, oh, it prefers signature verification, but that's not the case. It, no, it, it's, it's, it's a choice. One or the other. Right. Right. Exactly one. Yes. It, because doing, I mean, we could do both, but that's really redundant. <laughs> well, no. Yay! I picked up a new .NET framework and it passed the signature check and then immediately fails. Exactly. The hash check. So it just doesn't make sense doesn't. to do both. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Um, so, I, I, sorry, I, where I'm going is remote payload. We don't want to encourage remote payload. It, you know, it requires you to run heat, basically. I mean, you could manually author it, but yeah, that requires a certain level of masochism. Um, it, but if you are doing it primarily just, you know, on the .NET framework, you know, there's no reason, there's no reason not to um, support having a local file. 
I'm fine if we want to limit it to remote payload just to say, you know, this is the scenario, but um, that forces people to use remote payload when they could just as easily use a local file. That's true. And that, that's kind of where I was getting down to is the, we don't, if you want to use authentic code check, then go this way instead. The compiler doesn't, I mean, the language doesn't make it easy to get there. Right. All right. I think what I need to do is do a little more research into the feasibility of the MSU. thumbnails and then all the other payloads that could be there because that might be a challenge as well. Versus just bringing this thing back into the, the language again. All right, so I guess I need to go do a little more research and look at the, the payloads and think about that a little bit more. The XE, the difference between the XE and the MSU payloads. Hmm. Because I don't think authentic code signing MSI makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, what edit can you make yeah. to an MSI that isn't going to break things? You'd have to essentially rebuild the exact same. I mean, the package code could change, <laughs> but everything else would have to stay the same. Yeah, and. That just doesn't. It, it it's bad practice because it would you, yeah the the package code could change, but everything else would have to stay the same, and it's just kind of encouraging people to have multiple packages out there floating around out there of you know, the same version. Yeah, it, it's like, the scenario yeah, just doesn't no. make sense there. No. Also, we we'd have well, to for, add harvesting. Well, harvest for, yeah. all the data that we need. Yeah. Well, we already harvest all the data we yeah. need. We just have to serialize it. To Sorry. Yes. We ha well, we harvest it from the binder. We'd have to harvest it from heat we would to support remote same. payload. And again, uh, this is not remote payload versus not remote payload scenario. I mean, it could be, but you know, if it it basically comes down to how broad should we support, how broadly should we support authentic code only verification? Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. We could pivot and say, okay, remote payloads only. And then we come down to the, well, what about MSU packages? And that's that, that's my proposal. And now, and it probably should work for MSUs. Um, and it right. should work for XEs. Has to work for XEs. Should, yeah. Really, yeah, it, it should work for MSUs. But everything else has, the, the binding is so tight that I don't think it's going to work out well. Which means that yep. it's possible. So that's why I'm I'm gonna go look. Uh, let me I'm gonna go dig into a little bit, see what it takes there. Well, I mean, then, what about the additional payloads for the package? Yeah, that's like, the, that's the other part I have to go dig into and see what if what if if and what should be done there. Because what if? Well, I guess I mean, what if they want to change the files in the MSI? Where? Okay, maybe. They provide the MSI to the build process, but then they change the cabs behind the scenes afterwards. If they're changing the cabs, then it's very likely that something in one of the MSI tables is going to be wrong. Challenging to do that well. And the file size will be wrong, which I think right. they will really it, affect yeah. you in costing. But still, I mean, it's... Every Every file would change. Every file row, that every every file row for a changed file is likely to change. Yeah. Um, if it's an unversioned file, the hashes are going to be hash wrong. Change again. I just i I've seen people. I've seen, I've seen the request. Right? You know, yes, people want to do this, but it basically comes down to they want burn to just you know. Be a scripting language to launch MSIs, yeah. and Burn does more than that. So I, I don't I don't want to get into a state where we encourage extremely odd behavior. 
But of course, there's always a workaround, right? You can always, always put it, in, put it in an XE if you are going to this length, or just build again. <laughs> I mean, or just yeah, take take the hit, yeah, build again. Okay. It's possible. It's just not realistic. All right, I need to look at the additional payload thing and figure out what the right answer is there. It could be that it just turns into a a bit on the remote the remote package part. It's still done in the binder, but it's only exposed through the remote element instead of in the main language. Again, to push it out of as something you have to set in like heat. I want this file when you when I refer to it remotely, I want it to use its authentic code check. Although then you have to have the files. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, it still has to be in the language, right? For, yeah, then it has to be in the language. language. So we're, we're just missing that all up. Cause like for, that means that it doesn't work for .NET Framework right now. Okay, I, I have to go dig into the remote elements deeper now and see what we do there. Okay. All right. Uh, this thing got way more involved than I originally thought it would be. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll just bring this code back. It's some funky stuff. I don't really like having all this certificate nonsense in the mix. Oh, here we are, deep, 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 deep in the system. All right. Wow, fun. All right. Um, Wix bundle executable cache. Uh, Wix bundle execute package cache folder is not accessible in the BA for per machine packages, 6505. Um, not sure I want to do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. What would you use it for? You'd be able to go get things that got cached. Like, right. I guess you could replace files in there after Vern already verified it. <laughs> no. I mean, well, I, I, I guess you could. If you're elevated, you could. But if your BA is not elevated, you can't. I mean, if it's a per user package. Oh, yes, if it's per <laughs> right. If it's per user, <laughs> but this is for per machine, so I was like, eh. that's true. Yeah. So you'd have to. I mean, essentially, they want to reach in and use something from their BA. I we can add something else if they need that. But using this variable for that, I don't think is something I want to do. Like we could add when burn finishes caching a package, it could tell the BA as part of the complete message where where it is. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I think the, the use of the variable here is kind of, you know, it's one of those magic variables again that I dislike so much. Um, do, do we, we have any it? variables that appear during execution? This is pretty much the only one. Interesting. Yeah. And is it only on the elevated side? Well, it does it for all of them. The The problem is, is that it's generated while executing the package. Yeah, as opposed to during plan. Right. Why is it not generated during plan? That's really because of the redirection. It might find it in the original one instead of the redirected. <laughs> oh, the redirection. Cache policy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. OK. Um, right, it can't know until execution. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm not married to it. Um, so you're saying instead, let's just send it back as part of the cache message. That that would be fine. I, I, I don't have any strong opinions. If, uh, I'm fine with killing the variable, or sorry, not doing, not making this variable available to the BA. 
Yeah, um, it, right. It's for an XC's package. I'm completely wishy washy on, on whether we actually give the path to the BA. That just yeah. seems like one of those. Yeah. Why do you need it? All your files should be there. What are you trying to do? They're trying I was to reach gonna wait the package cache. for a feature request for that. I wasn't going to do it. Okay, good. Good. There we go. All right. That's easy. Uh, this, give this to me. I'm going to fix this with my, my push to web things. The broken link. Yeah, we should fix that. The assignment agreement process has changed a little bit more, and I will fix the link to be the correct place where it's at. Oh, it's actually easier now. All right. The ability to skip burn integration tests during runtime. Version of X unit we're using does not have BI yeah, built-in support for this. Ability to skip a test during runtime, for example, when this space two. Yeah, this is the this space two logging turned off because for whatever reason the GitHub uh, servers don't have enough disk space when we hit this thing. Um, oh, this is a five gig. Yeah, the, we have a test that generates a five gig file, and GitHub provides four gigs. Um, I I really think it's your Debugging was writing a log that filled up the space. Debugging was writing a log. You were writing a line every single time that a file was added to a cab. And one of the burn integration bundles adds 10,000 <laughs> files to a cab. Writing a Actually, file that contains, is that the, is that the contents file? Or no, when you were debugging the CI issues, you made Wix native log out a line saying which file it was adding to the cab. Oh, is it still doing that? No. No, I took that out. Okay, good. <laughs> but I, the, the file test was probably it. failing while you had that enabled. I see. So I think GitHub Actions was writing every single line to a log on disk. <laughs> Uh, and there's so, plenty to use. So the so hope the now is, is that this test is not being skipped, so we'd have to go into the log to find out if it says, because it spits something out of the console. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that it needs, it builds the bundle with a five gig file. So that's what I was trying to tell you in the comment was that it creates the five gig file when it builds the bundle, yep. then it deletes it, and then it creates it again when it actually runs the test. So it had five gig at some point, and then it went less than five gig between bundle building the bundle and running the test. Yep. Could, could we solve this problem by using a four gig file instead? Well, it, it sounds it, really it needs borderline. To be over four gig. It's it's trying to hit a four gig okay. boundary. Well, it, it sounds. It sounds I mean, like yeah, right it could be border. four point five or four point right, one. Exactly. Or yes. Yeah, yeah. We can do that. I just didn't think we'd ever hit it. But I guess I was wrong. <laughs> Apparently, we get we get 5.1 gigs of free space. No, we get 14. VM. We get 14. Oh, well, sorry, is that 14 total? Yeah. Okay, but that's just 14 gigs of data, not including OS and friends. I, I they weren't specific about that part. Okay. It's the typical, your phone has this much space. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. I don't know how much is used for the operating system. <laughs> that number sounds good, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I've i looked at XUnit a long time ago trying to figure out how to programmatically skip tests while the test was running, and I didn't find anything. And I certainly didn't haven't gone back recently to go look at it. Um, well, the problem is if, if again, if, if it's that borderline, just building it is problematic. Because it sounds like again, this we're right we're right on the edge. So, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna say we add another architecture, um, and you know it'll blow up. It sounds like we need to do something, you know, to prevent the build from happening as well. If the build also creates a five gig file. Yeah, I, think, I don't know if the build's gonna create a five gig file. It does. You mean the test? I mean the. No, the I mean, build. build. The build, the build will create the five gig file. Because it builds the bundle, and the bundle needs the file available to create the bundle. It needs the file information. 
All right, I, I didn't look closely at the test. I thought the test did all the building. No, and that is the setup to the test that created this file, then it created the bundle, and then it kept going. No, the, none of those tests build bundles. They just run bundles. I see. So the bundle, are, wait, but then the bundle must already have a reference to that file. Exactly. That's why I was so confused, because the build creates that 5 gig file and then builds the bundle, and then later the tests actually run. And the reason I do that is because I copy the output folder from my computer to my VM. I don't want to copy the 5 gig file yep. from my computer to my VM. So I make the build delete it, and then the test recreates it. <laughs> I, I don't know. Because I just put a check to set if the file system doesn't have enough space, don't create the file and skip the test. And this then, issue wasn't supposed to be that complicated. I thought I might want this for something else. So Yeah, I, honestly, here, here's the fun thing. If you find this or create it or whatever, that'd be great because I've wanted it in the past too. <laughs> I, I would love to have this. I just don't know how to do it in next unit. Um, and that's mostly, mostly out of a lack of trying, not that it's impossible. I think it's just really complicated because you have to create your own. XUnit has a lot of extensive ability points, and basically you have to write a lot of extension code to make it work. The hook in. Man, that's why it doesn't exist yet. But yeah, that would be very cool. Ability so, is best. Are you volunteering to look at this? No. It's almost an XUnit feature request, although they don't really take feature requests. They keep it minimal, and then they really let you go and build your own things on top of them. So I mean I I might look at it if it starts failing, but right now I probably will not work on it. Right. All right. Okay. I'll just put it in four X. Valley specify heat architecture. From I think it's appropriate that a heat bug is issue six 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 six. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. This I don't care. <laughs> I agree. But there's a lot of things that heat needs done to it, so Well this is just MS build stuff. Yeah, but it's all the heat directory stuff or project directory. It's it's only MS build work. I mean, it, and the heat targets, yeah, but it's only in this build work. Are we already building heat in three architectures? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, technically it's only x86 and x64 for .NET Framework, and it's a framework, what, what's it called? All, it builds for architecture independent in .NET Core, just like Wix XE. Oh, well, that's going to be a problem. Why a problem? Uh, well, heat.exe uh, depends. On, it depends on what you're harvesting, right? If you're harvesting 32-bit COM controls. Or comp servers, you need heat to run x86. In v3, we accomplish this by setting x86 preferred on heat.exe, and there's only one of them, which means heat can't do 64 bit com today in v3. Yeah, this is, yeah. Yep, it's all. Yep, getting heat to behave well in all these scenarios. It's fine. It's MS build. It's just MS build. I don't know why you keep on saying heat. <laughs> because heat, we, the MS build targets have to cooperate with the architecture of heat.exe. I don't think we can have, we need three different, well, uh, I don't know. 
I don't know. It, I, I, I don't know enough about what you've done with heat in B4 to intelligently comment. So I will eventually just be quiet. I mean, I guess my point is we're already building a version of heat for x86, x64, and not really ARM64, but we can build it for ARM64. I don't think .NET Framework lets you do that, so I think we're building all of the architectures that we can build today. So we just need to expose in the heat targets. The user can specify which architecture of heat they want. Yep. OK. So what are we doing with the bug? Now quiet down one at a time. <laughs> architecture for the task until a few weeks ago. I see. So it's the architecture attribute on the task that lets you do this. I see. So you have to have the task authored three times, one for or two times, whatever, however many architectures there are, and then use the right task for the different inputs. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Or just have one task, and then the task is responsible for spawning the process. Right. Then go into the heat directory and the heat project or whatever the entry points are and change them. Yep. So I don't know which way to go, and I don't, not terribly interested in doing this right now. So. Yeah, me either. So, all right. So I guess that's 4x unless someone else wants to pick it up, and we will roll on from there. Yeah. So okay. it may be done in just targets, but you may also have to go into the task code, right? Uh, reboot required volatile key does not always go away. So, I apologize for opening this bug. Yeah. I've been dreaming about this bug. <laughs> really? Um, my in my nightmares. nightmares. It's just been like... Oh, okay. Good, good. No, it's not like, oh, I, this is such an awesome bug. It's been, ah, uh, what do we do? So, yeah. Bob, you can explain. It's like, the key does, right. a volatile so, key doesn't always go away when you restart. Well, it goes away... Um, but you have to not do the the fast. <laughs> I love this combination: fast startup, shutdown, <sighs> jumbo shrimp. Um, yeah. So Windows 10 and I'm assuming above. Um, basically, it's it's weird. They save the state for a normal um, for a normal reboot, normal shutdown as well the they don't shut down the kernel they basically hibernate the kernel they log you out and hibernate the kernel and then reboot the machine the the kernel comes back in whatever state it was which means in this case that the volatility of a registry key is basically ignored because the kernel and I'm saying kernel I'm sure it's yeah more of the subsystems never shut down. They're just swapped out. And they swap back in, and it's like there was a reboot in that user space went away, and you were logged out, but the core of the OS did not. So we rely on the volatile registry key to magically go away when a reboot happens. Um, and if in the default configuration, that's not happening. The problem is, how else do you detect when a reboot happened? Yeah. And I haven't come up with an answer, so I've been leaning toward the idea that we should probably do away with this feature, the reboot detection, or 
or make it optional or whatever. I was wondering if we could put the uptime or the, the system start time in the key. Like, but I don't know if this thing... Like, and does that get reset? Exactly. Does it get changed yeah. when the machine comes back? Right. But I restarted this machine, but the uptime is the same. You're like, wow, that's cool. Um, or really bad. Yeah, can we, sorry. Can, cool. we, can we use an event? I guess if burn was running, could we use an event to clear it? With if we get an event from Windows saying that a restart is definitely happening. Well, I we already running that. most of the time. But yeah, it would only be if you're rebooting directly from the the you know bundle prompt. And would the bundle do a full shutdown, or is the bundle initiating a fast shutdown? I guess you don't know. No, it, I mean, in the end, we have to be able to support both where the user says, no, don't restart now, and then the user kicks it off later, which is the more complicated case anyway. Would run once be of any use? Um, no, because run once can happen on the next login, right? Yeah, I think run once would go on the login. I'm not sure though. Yeah, so it's we need something that doesn't get held on by the kernel, huh? For that will outlast the process. Yeah, the the reboot from the bundle is the simple case. Could we like create a mutex or something that would yeah, outlive the process? Yeah, you'd have to. Someone has to own it, I think. I wonder if we could use the global atom table. Again, we're trying to Again. find something that the kernel doesn't yeah. hold on to, but the atoms yeah. are generally associated with Windows. Uh, like, sorry, window, like winter. <laughs> uh, create yeah. window. Register window class. I wonder if that would, I don't know if that goes cross users or if it's per user. It's global for the whole user or is it global across all the users? Uh, that's interesting. I don't know. <laughs> well, and, and again, I also don't know, you know, does it in this fast, fast and, startup yes. shutdown case, does it go away? Right. My hope is it would, because it, it's related to windows on the screen. And presumably, when if, you close well, and you log it, off, all the windows it, go away, right? Yeah, but it's not – but it, it technically has nothing to do with – I mean, it is, it's in Winbase, winbase.h. So that's one of those, you know, it's not – I mean, you don't pass it in hwind. No. I wonder, what if we like registered a clipboard format? <laughs> uh, well, okay, that is more likely to, you know, be torn down at logout, but. So it sounds like we want to try to address this. Well, I'm not as actually, I forgot what we lose when we. We don't have well that's the thing we don't lose a whole lot the you know there there have been complaints in the past that this prevents a user from from running a bundle any 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 trigger that a bundle required a reboot and the user did not immediately reboot is blocked by burn right and that's you know a, a you know maximally safe approach and that's fine. Um, but
but you know it's not there are, there are plenty of cases where you know it's safe to do some other operation with the bundle uh, and we, again we took the maximally safe approach and and that's reasonable i guess but you know it can't be overridden right burn blocks apply in this case and there's other bugs that i opened uh, because currently there's no way to detect that there's no way to detect that burn is going to block and apply mm. from your ba yeah. you can't detect the state which you know it's kind of rude that you go through your perhaps multi-page install wizard <laughs> and be told that that's you have true. to reboot first that's true that is unfortunate um so so yeah i have bugs on that so if we took this out then you could get into a situation where burn has scheduled a whole bunch of stuff for restart then or schedule a whole bunch of operate well not burn um like an installation an MSI package or whatever has scheduled a bunch of changes during restart to be applied during restart and then you do operations more installation operations after that you restart and then the uh, those operations get applied and you end up in an unexpected state doesn't right. MSI block you from And it might not even know, right? It's like, hey, I schedule all these files for delete, and then some install comes along and says, hey, I'm going to install them now because whatever process is holding them in, you know, in lock. Actually, it, away and I yeah, you because know, there is a there is a reboot pending uh, property, and then there's the replace files in use property, but the latter is only set during a transaction. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, so an alternative is well, two alternatives. One is you know, burn could detect the state early, right, during detect, mm -hmm. and let the BA know at that point, but and let the BA override it, but, yeah. or yeah. we could simply expose it, and I think we're doing this today, or again, there's a bug open by me um, that says this state should be reflected in the existing you know, reboot pending variable. So then any BA could, you know, block it as a launch condition. Okay, I admit I'm editorializing. I don't like this feature, so I'm fine if, you know, we we solve this bug of registry, you know, volatile registry keys by, you know, doing something different. Well, we could take it out. I'm a little fuzzy on exactly how much damage a user can do to themselves. We could keep it. No, if we kept it, what would that tell us? That would just tell us that. Yeah, we'd be able to say, hey, a reboot is pending. <laughs> And the user would be like, I just did a reboot. And you're like, right. So that's, oh well, yeah, but you didn't do the right kind of reboot. <laughs> well, and the problem is, as far as I can tell, this is a setting of, of how, it, sorry, it's it's not an option. There isn't a drop down that says no really reboot. Yeah. Please. I was wondering about You have that. to change a window setting in order to do this. As far as I can tell, uh, I didn't dig deeply into, you know, like, is there a, um, is there a flag on a shutdown message? I don't know. Or message function. Really makes volatile registry. He's not volatile anymore. Um, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're pretty plucky for volatile registry keys. <laughs> um, And we can leave it to the user, and then when bad things happen, it'll be interesting. How did the user get into the state kind of thing? Oh, they didn't take the reboot, and then they did an uninstall, and then they took the reboot, and then it got weird. <laughs> right. Or they actually, uh, 
maybe the the scarier one is they uninstall requires a reboot, then they install again, and you end right. up in who knows where. Well, most likely you're going to end up in a failure there. After the restart? And, no, no, no. Af- during the install, after a partial uninstall. But, uh, but you're right. Anything is possible, right? You can absolutely get into a bad state. Um, the the biggest problem for me is that this this part- this volatile registry registry key is that regardless of the underlying reasons for the reboot being required, right? You this is set if the BA just says, yeah, require a reboot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there there's the bundle will not, not be happy looking again at until the, you reboot. Yeah, exactly. Which okay, BAs have a lot of power. Um, but you know, we're not looking at, at underlying causes. Windows doesn't necessarily agree with this with this key. True. It is local to the bundle. Right. Yeah, which you know, <laughs> which means it's also a limited form of protection. Right. Another bundle is uh, another bundle has no way of knowing that some other bundle has a you know pending reboot. And yeah, I suppose if they share things, you get into this sort of state as well. Yeah. Right. I didn't realize it was per bundle. If it's per bundle, I think we should just pull it then. I'm pretty sure it's per bundle, right? Yeah. It's the bundle. It's the bundle ID dot yeah. reboot required or something. And it's the bundle ID, so it's exactly that bundle. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, actually, that is kind of interesting, isn't it? It means, say, you uninstall v1, bundle v1. It requires a reboot, but you say no. Then you install bundle v2. That bundle will execute up until the point it tries to run the uninstall of bundle v1. Oh no! Now presumably that registration is gone. I was wondering if you get into a state where bundle v2 failed because it could not uninstall bundle v1. Well, it would, right? I mean, where's it writing that volatile key to? Its registration yeah. key. Uh, it's a sibling of the bundle registration, but if the bundle, if bundle v1 uninstall actually successfully removed its registration, then it wouldn't be detected as a related bundle. How can it be but, per bundle if it's not inside its registration? It's a sibling. It's bundle ID dot reboot required as a sibling key. And I think that's just for ease of detection. Does this key exist rather than having to open the key and then check a value? Yeah, I just pull it. Yeah, I can't defend it enough to. Yeah, there's. We're probably opening it up to some class of problems, but we probably are exposed to those problems in other ways. So, how much value are we really hitting here? I don't know. So. I won't defend it. <laughs> All right. The, is this getting pulled in V4 then? Yep. I'll take it. All right. All right. Killing stuff. Ooh, that uh, sounded bad. Uh, six, wait. Okay, so, yeah. Six, 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 nine. Um, oh, 64-bit keys. All right, so Reg... Oh, yeah, created... sorry, this was a whole a whole series of annoying bugs that I opened. Uh, are you taking this? Because... I support for this seems reasonable. Or 
Sure, I don't disagree. It'd be nice to be able to open the bitness of the key, specify the bitness well, of the key. So this came up, um, actually, jump ahead to 6670. 6670, all right. Oh. Uh, okay. So this is all kind of related. We have this, now that we have 64-bit burn engines, <laughs> the registration for bundles because of 6669 um, red Judel not supporting 32-bit keys means that all bundle registration is happening in the 64-bit registry hive, which is, I think, the correct thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, except, um, and I guess I didn't actually make this explicit, 6670 was, was supposed to um, get into this. It's, it's not just beutil, but it's the fact that that Right, right now, I think we have a, 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 a hole that a 64-bit burn bundle will not do any kind of related bundle operations on a 32-bit bundle. Oh, yeah, that's probably true. That's bad. Yeah. I mean, shouldn't everyone write to the 32-bit hive? Uh, that is a fine question. We're, aren't we writing to a location that Windows magically mirrors? I think well, I we're read, writing. I think I read Perfect. something about that with Deputal, where it's purposely writing to a key that Windows mirrors between the 32-bit hive and the 64-bit hive. Deputal yeah, that's does. HKCR. But, but ARP? Uh, I don't but know. not ARP, because that's a plain software yeah. software key. So there's no 64-bit to 32-bit reflection. Yeah. HKCR is reflected that way, but not, not ARP. The, ARP. the uninstall key yeah. is just So Deputal is written that way the... specifically to solve that problem, but Burn didn't have that. I mean, ARP isn't. Burn has to write its registration to ARP because that's where installed programs is going to look. And your program's going to look so, yeah. And isn't that how related bundles are found? They're not found through yes. the deputal stuff. They're found by looking at the installed programs. That and is the, correct. The, uh, I don't the uninstall because strength. that's the yeah, the uninstall key is is where all of the the bundle registration happens. Yeah. Dependency registration is a different thing. Yeah. You might think they could be combined, but blah blah blah. Yeah, Burn probably has to look in both. The weird thing or is, register in the 32-bit registry hive. Or but always I, register in 30-bit hive. I guess that's another option. Well, <laughs> I guess always and only, right? Yes. We have we, we couldn't rely on the 64-bit, and we don't want to duplicate it. Yeah, I expect this is a very real problem. If you were to move from a 32-bit bundle to a 64-bit bundle, just because... I.e. 100% of V3 bundles. Yeah, right. Then your upgrades probably stop working. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Probably have to do something here. Maybe I'll have to fix this. Yeah. And now you see why I volunteered to do the first easy one. <laughs> All right. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, I, I will take six, 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 nine as well. Okay. Um, I, I don't know that I want to. I don't know that I can do 6670 anytime reasonably soon. So I would take it as well. We're going to have to put it, it before, gets... though. I mean, we have to. I yeah, no, exactly. We have to. Exactly. I That's why I'm concerned to. about volunteering oh. for it. I never even thought about this. Yeah. I didn't until I was recently working with a Fire Giant customer on registration problems. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, wait. 
Yeah, I have to do something here. Oh, that sucks. I'm uh, I'm happy to volunteer to do it. I'm just a little concerned. It's not a it's a low level change. Yeah, I mean, yeah. All right. Well, we'll have to do something before four ships. So. All right. I will take it for now. Okay. Extension for VS twenty twenty two. This is a reminder for me to update the website. So I think we can take triage off of it, and it's assigned to me. So we will do that. Dark extracting com plus application with dark one o five nine com plus. Uh, sure. If someone wants to tackle it, they can. But this is three X only because we have no decompiler sensibility in V four. Yeah. It's Yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, can go out there and someone can pick it up if they want. I don't think any of us are going to pick that up anytime soon. Can patch, with tag, burn, you know, integration test is failing. So yeah, go ahead and give this to me. Looks like something wasn't completely fixed. Um, Dutch translations uh, for util extension. So I took this in four already. He sent PRs. Thank you very much. Um, Oh, nice. Do we take them in three? We have another, we have the Ukraine translation bug. We took that. Okay. And I think that says we'll take it. You can go ahead and give this to me, and I'll go put it in three at some point. And it will wait around until we have another build. Um, Wix convert shows error messages, which are actually informational. So... WixCop doesn't have the concept of error levels, though, right? It's everything's an error because it's, it only it only looks at things that it's going to fix. Correct. And I guess one could argue that when it's fixing them, it should just be info messages instead of error messages, but which I think is the point here. Do you fix informationals? No, you fix errors. No, no. When you run Wix convert in fix mode, it would switch. Right? Um, yeah, that's great, Mark. What? I'm confused. I'm confused by your statement. If Wix convert is run in fix mode, does it still spit out errors? Oh, so I'm confused by your question. I don't know. That's the, yeah. I think it does. I think it just spits out errors everywhere. I haven't looked in a while. It didn't even, it didn't even register me. It's just like, yeah, these are all the things that have to get fixed. Um, yeah, so, so the thing is, if you're saying, hey, please fix these for me, well, they're not errors anymore. It's just information. By the way, this didn't declare, it didn't have this, so... It's now just an info message instead of a, it's a, by the way, this, this happened. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Let's see. I, I think we put fixing on the end. No, we don't. Um, sometimes we do. Do we? I, or yeah. We, sometimes we word them that way. Yeah. So it's, you know. Yeah, so convert, let's see. <laughs> Ignore, false, oh, right? So slow. Yeah, so if we're fixing, it basically says if we're fixing it, change the error message so it's not an error. It's an information, it's an error, which is fair. Right? I think that makes sense. Yeah. Well, uh, sorry, the proposed code doesn't do that. It treats these two messages that way, but not all of them. And what I'm hearing from you, Rob, is it should be informational if it is fixing them and an error otherwise, uh, but I, globally. Yeah, I guess I thought it was just did the top two and then there's all the other ones. It was going to be a, a repeating pattern. So, yeah. Right. Because <laughs> my favorite joke about Wixcop that I blogged about some time in the long ago past 
um, is that Rixcop had, at least, and maybe still has, an error message saying the white space is incorrect. <laughs> an yeah. error message that says the white space is incorrect. Yeah, it's it's very particular. I mean, exactly. I, I, Derek wrote it, so I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. That's. I think I even mentioned that in the blog post. Yeah, it um, comes as no surprise. So yeah. it's just that's the if if Wix Cup would fix it, it's an error. I I think think I like the idea of what you said is that if it's fixing it, it's not an error anymore. Right. If it's not fixing it, well, that's an error. Right, right. And then we can argue can about each individual rule, whether it's a good rule or not. But Well, yes, but that's why we have the config files. So right, can, exactly. I can choose your leisure. Exactly. So I, I think this is a small uh, confusion point. It's like all these errors are like, oh, no, it failed. And you're like, no, 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 actually, right. it right. was just fixing these things. And I think that was Mark's point when he opened the issue. At least that's what I read. He was like, I got all these errors. It's like, no, they're not errors. They're just information. Oh, well, then how about you make them information messages? It's like, uh, yeah, sure. Make them info messages. <laughs> so, and I said that would be a fine thing. So, yeah. And then, like I said, the pattern would continue. It's like these two, dot, dot, dot. All the rest of them. So, yeah. Now, the trick is going to be I don't know how you do this without making it ginormously annoying. I don't know how much text you want to do just to change it from an error to an info, and it might just be if you're fixing fixed the error, you know, contained to this or whatever. So I don't know if we want to maintain a whole lot of extra text between the error and then the fix line, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I would keep them the same. Uh, yeah, and come up with a programmatic difference, right? Error or info. This was fixed. Yeah. The file. Actually, I'm wondering, if it's not It's not info. It's it's a fix message. Yeah, it's fixed this it's info message. Yeah. And a little more than verbose, but I don't know. Just something to tell you, hey, look, I did work. So when you look at your file, you're like, oh, it fixed yeah. a lot of things. Or, oh, it fixed two things. You know, whatever. But we don't want to maintain a separate message between the error and the fixed. Or even an extra message for fixed. It's just like, error. This file contains this fixed. This file contains an next right. multi first line. Like, basically, programmatically add the word fixed before. Or something like this. Whatever looks good. So we don't want to add a whole bunch of extra messages to deal with. It just ends up being yeah, no, I think all the messages should be the same. And and at the same time, the, the tests that we have should, we, sh we shouldn't discriminate. It's like, if you don't want to be told that your white space is incorrect, you remove the white space test from your config file. I agree with that. I thought we already have two different commands. We do. There's like convert and format, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and convert skips the formatting stuff, right. basically. Yep. That's a built in just because it's like the, the main one. Don't need to change any of that. It's just, all right, cool. I think that's pretty simple. Just don't add a whole lot more messages to maintain because <laughs> we already have enough in there. And writing them is sometimes not much fun. It takes a little while. No. <sighs> Corrupt Wix PDB when using Wix UI minimal. If you weren't going to dig in this, Sean, you can give it to me. I don't I don't know why things are not being encoded, but I feel like I've had problems with this character in the past. So. I didn't know how you want to fix it. I mean, nah, you this... should, should be putting C data for that, right? Yeah, and is it just uh, C data, yeah. or is it that character that's a problem? Well, it's not. It's not doing C data, so it just has field and then RTF contents. And that's really strange. But it should. But we're not writing it, so we should encode it. 
but they need this one to be written to CD. I don't. All right. Anyway, if you don't want to fix it, I'll I'll fix it. Um, yes, it should just work. Kind of surprised that we don't have any tests that use Wix UI minimal and attempt to open it. But I guess it just slipped through. All right, command line processing does not prevent um, execution on failure. This is a thing I've hit this week, right here. Okay, there's an unknown command line option. It stops parsing command line, but it continues operation. And need to go improve the tests around this because apparently I fixed one part and broke a different part, or just didn't catch this scenario. So yeah, go ahead. That's already signed to me. Just left it here to talk about it. So that yay. Okay. Whew. All right. Sean, I think we're gonna have to get to your thing next week or two weeks from now. <laughs> it's been doing okay. this a lot. <laughs> I kind of figured triage was gonna take quite a while today when I saw what was coming in. So let's wrap up because I know someone else had a question out there. Hopefully they're still around and they stuck around through all the triage, but we'll see um, what's happening. What's there? All right. Um, after much experimentation with uh, my own stream, I've I'm coming to like the way YouTube works um, and the way that it broadcasts things and all that kind of stuff. So I, and and nobody's expressed strong opinions any which way. So uh, plan is that in the next year, so that's not the next meeting, that's the next year, uh, we'll be moving all this stuff to YouTube. Who does that affect? That affects all of you right here in chat with us right now. It's essential to be a different URL. We will put the URL in the links to everything. So just continue to click on the links that come out in the emails or the tweets or the discussion issue that gets opened um, every two weeks. Whichever one you use to get here, click on that link as opposed to uh, directly navigating to Twitch. Uh, we will be in a different location. So I think that's the only um, interesting change of all of this. Um, but we'll do that. And I bring that up because our next meeting is I, the 30th. Um, I think we all said we're going to be here, right? If I remember correctly. Bob, Sean? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. So uh, we will we will be back in two weeks same time, same place, and all that kind of thing. And we will talk again about moving to YouTube, which we'll do in 2022. So we'll have one more meeting um, for those of you with us live on Twitch, and then we will do the move. That also gives me three more weeks, assuming I keep up with my current rate of doing of live broadcasting to YouTube. That gives me three more, three more weeks, one, two, three, yeah, three more weeks of experimentation with that to, or not just experimentation, uh, practice, <laughs> practice with the new, YouTube live thing. Uh, I like it. There's just a few things that are different that I have to get cleaned up. Okay. So someone asked a question at the very top of chat. So Ron started a question about some issue he's having. I don't know if he's building or consuming the util, but then he said he sent the mail and I think it's long enough that we will probably go through the mail, but we'll see. Um, someone else asked something about 2022. I don't know where that chat message went now. It says something like, does Wix oh. work on VS 2022? And yes, Wix works fine, and there will be an extension for Wix 3 Visual Studio 2022 coming out soon. We've had some, I don't know, people being difficult about it, but yes, that is all coming. Um, so yes, that will be coming out very soon, probably over but the next weekend. Indeed. There's like three different features there, really. So it, they're talking about Visual Studio integration, opening the project inside Visual Studio, then that's what you're talking about. There's that, yes, but Wix should also, I've been using Wix in Visual Studio 2022, it's been fine there. But if they're talking about like working in Wix and V4 on 2022. So developing Wix. That answer is kind of kind of not because we don't support v143 yet i can't build certain projects because it's trying to build them with v143 which means i can't find dutal because dutal doesn't have support for it right now well and then, it's not that it can't find it it won't actually look for it because of how the props files were well, set up 
the error I get is can't find util.h because it doesn't. Oh, because, well, okay. Yes, and then, sorry. And then there's the Visual Studio extension. If you're trying to build something that extends Visual Studio, we don't have anything to support the properties to detect That's Visual true. Studio. Nobody's, nobody's that done the work there for the Visual Studio 22 extension yet. That issue is and open, and someone can do that. If they want to build a custom action with v143, then technically we don't have a v143 library, but I guess we're not yeah. ever going to. That's going to come in four. Yeah. That's going to come in four. Well, no, we're doing v141 for everything, right? But it's going to work but if you're building the for the files like will work, yeah. yeah. Well, they can use the v140 from Wix3 then, right? Yes, but not you're right. But oh, but there's no NuGet for that right now, right? So yeah, they can just ref. Yeah, you have to do work to do it. Yeah. And I guess they're not no. here to clarify which one they're asking. But... No, you probably got bored a while ago. V one for V four one for V one for one is in Wix V three because we have 2017 libs. That's one for one. Okay. So that that will work, that will work as well. Yes, you just have to. And in fact, in at it. in V314, we have ARM64 for those. Yes. So much, so many different things. <laughs> all these new releases of Visual Studio. Um. All right. So. Let's see, can we take a quick shot at Ron's thing here? Libs and Wix. In Libs, we find util. In Wix, we find Wix native, right? So Wix native is built in, yeah, then it uses the util as a package. Everything, my base commit has no problems with the setup. However, he has a working commit. Wix native can't find the util and many other references in the util. Uh, okay. Generate. But um, did you did you change dutil? I've been using the monitor where I am at, but I can't see inside. I must build to figure out why one commit works and the other doesn't. The documentation. He's pointing, oh. he's pointing to his branch, but his branch is 93 commits ahead of develop. <laughs> That's a lot. A lot. Um, but if it, if there are changes in dutil, then it might just be a clean problem or a need to clean problem, right? Because you end up with this mix of stale diesel. Uh, th this is one of my biggest pet peeves about the build today is you need to nuke a whole lot. Rob, you added a clean command. Is that in develop? Uh, I forget. Did it, I haven't I'm... seen that. OK. I... I thought, wasn't he saying it couldn't find a header file, too? Mark. Yeah, he's saying Wix native can't find util.h. Ron is saying that. And I don't know how that. There's a lot of different ways that could happen, right? Right. Yeah, no, that's in this current branch. Okay. I haven't brought that around yet. I've cleared the NuGet cache. Is it related? I don't. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. In in develop right now, we build one four zero, one four one, one four two. Yep. So as long as you're using one of those, dutil is built. Sorry, dutil is built in all three of those. Um, plus architectures for one four one and one four two. So as long as you're building Wix native, Wix native is going to use the latest. Um, the latest tool set. And again, in develop, that's marked on almost all the projects as v142. So as long as you're building dutil with v142 and then works native with v142, that should work. It's also not exactly. Can't find dutil. I have to lower and note down the includes.
I don't know, if you could toss the bin log somewhere, that might be interesting. Yeah, the, the bin logs will at least show you, well, it, it'll show you that you're not getting the package ref. Um, but it will also show, sorry, it will, it will show you that you're not getting the right directories passed in um, for dutil. And then it'll point, the package ref should show up and probably point out, probably, um, when the, the dutil props file is getting evaluated. That will be in the bin log. Uh, it's so. Pick Is there a, a discussion? Pick, pick a file. Do discussions share. have attachments? I don't know, but it could be. I guess I don't know how long the big logs are. They can get pretty big. Um, oh, just put on any files, anything that can share a file out, and, you know, G drive or OneDrive or any of the drive things. Someone can download it. I'm. It's very amazing so many of these problems and I don't have them so I don't have experience <laughs> going oh yeah yeah I had that problem do this I don't know why I missed so many of these problems macros appear to be undefined yeah or empty yeah but I, I mean a bin log may be the easiest thing to look at to see why it's not finding digital or where it's looking at least for digital and then go from there. Also, how you're building is probably interesting as well. Like, what are you using to try to build these things? If you just try to build from the root one time and you hit these, that's something. Something different from trying to build, say, just Wix native. Well, yeah, because you have to build it in order, right? But if you've built everything once, then trying to build just Wix native by itself should work. Um, but if you haven't built globally once, then yeah, you have to know all the dependencies to get things done in right order, to make sure things are laid out in correct order. Which is annoying, but yeah. All right. Anything else people have going on want to talk about? Uh, stuff. I think Mark said he's going to go tackle this format thing, so that'll be cool. And Ron's working on something. I haven't, but he sent his branch around, so we can maybe go look at that at some point and see what's going on there. Not that, though. Um, and yeah, other stuff? Things going on, being done? I guess we'll have uh, several pull requests to look at next time. <sighs> yeah, maybe. You have, what, one or two already? There's two right now. Yeah, two. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Of my post to an individual or to Wix devs. I mean, if you can send it to Wix devs, more likely someone will pick it up. More people look at it then. All right. Hour and a half in. I think we're good. Okay, so we will be back here. Same time, same place, all the normal stuff in two weeks, which is December 30th. So we'll do that. We'll wrap up 2021 with that meeting, and then we will move on into the future in new plans and new places. So two weeks from now, we'll be back, and we'll do it all again. Until then, you guys all have a wonderful two weeks and a Merry Christmas. Bye. Bye. Bye.